All right. So, um, yeah, I, I guess I uh, wanted to talk about um, grassroots resistance, but also some of the um, changes that we saw in recent years from the state's strategy towards surveilling um, black activists and some of the organizing that people have been doing to push back against some of this. Um, so I'll be talking about some of my experience with um, campaigning groups, students, um, Palestine solidarity organizers, um, as well as uh, 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 <clears throat> um, um, Muslim groups that I've um, had the pleasure of organizing with around um, various things that are very relevant and pertinent to today's conversation. Um, but I wanted to start uh, on the point of protest and policing, um, specifically with the Metropolitan Police's Territorial Support Group, um, TSG, who specialise in the euphemistically named area of policing referred to as public order policing. There's nothing orderly about it. And many of us who have been out on large protests and demonstrations might have seen them knocking about towards the end of the day. Um, they wear these very scary and intimidating looking um, paramilitary outfits with these circular shields that are not defensive at all, they're quite offensive. They use them to strike protesters as well as various other violent policing tactics that they employ, such as kettling and uh, the use of horses to trample protesters, which was um, made, mention to, uh, made mention of earlier on. Um, and some of these tactics weren't seen for a long time, um, people, saw, people said, um, uh, since the time of minor strikes, but I witnessed them during um, the wave of student protests after the tripling of tuition fees and the um, subsequent uh, protests that happened with uh, the trade union groups and whatnot afterwards. So we're seeing the bringing back of these violent policing tactics um, that uh, haven't been seen for a very long time um, on these shows. But, uh, uh, but the thing is that these violent tactics of taking energy away from protesters isn't the only uh, uh, isn't only limited to these overt acts of violence from the state through the police, but also um, the law has been used as a, uh, another means to discipline um, street movements uh, in recent years. So this then brings us to the recent Police Crime Sensing and Courts Act, right? That recent law that gave even more blanket powers to the police and brought with it a climate of fear, which I suppose wasn't new for all sections of society, um, but it's something that should be placed in the wider context of increasingly draconian and repressive legislation that's been passed by successive governments, not just Tory, but also Labour. And I'm talking about counter-terror legislation. Um, I think often about the Black and Muslim activists and organizations who in some ways were a canary in the coal mine, right? So when we look at what's happening with counter-terrorism, specifically the Counterterrorism and Security Act of 2015, um, which I was involved in some of the organizing uh, against that sort of passing, um, uh, uh, it was something that was rushed in the, wide, in the face of widespread dissent. So it, was, it was rushed through um, Parliament, right? Uh, and they used terms like so-called radicalization um, and anti-Muslim racism to whip up a climate of, uh, uh, of fear around things that weren't really a threat to British society. But they used anti-Muslim racism, and this is very important, and racism more broadly, as a wedge to open up the floodgates for more repression that is now affecting all sections of society. And crucially, um, I find that when I look at another um, uh, group of uh, protesters and organizers, um, um, uh, the pro-Palestinian um, uh, campaigners in this country and how they're dealt with by the state and by extension the police, we're seeing experimentation with new tactics um, similar to of course, what we see, what I, what I witnessed with student protests in 2010, so kettling and so on and so forth, right? Um, and this, 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 this speaks to this um, this idea that we can't escape the shadow cast by the colonial roots of policing, from those organizing in solidarity with those fighting for their national liberation in Palestine to the colonial situation in the north of Ireland. And there's a connection there too that some of you might find surprising. So recently, we had a wave of actions. <coughs> Um, by a uh, group named Palestine Action, which is a direct action solidarity group. Um, and during their sabotage of a factory used to manufacture weapons that kill Palestinians by the state of Israel. So during an action at a factory in the Midlands, they discovered that the, off the officer in charge of policing on that day was somebody who started his career uh, with the police, his lovely career in the uh, north of Ireland. And we don't need to go too far to understand um, how the policing uh, 
in that region is very much a colonial uh, one, and it's a very overt one. And these tactics of policing are being brought back um, to Britain, and it's something that brings with it impacts, right? It impacts on uh, political movements, and there are linkages to be drawn out there, and each one of them should be a reason for us to sort of try to organize with more meaningful solidarity across these different groups and to um, strengthen our resistance uh, uh, to these uh, increasingly um, repressive turns by the state. So what do we have to do, right? What, 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 is, the, what is the challenge for us now? It means we have to truly pay attention to the erosion of our civil liberties right? and resist the state. And that needs to be quite central to it. So there's no thinking about, you know, do we, do, we, do, we, do we push for reforms to these legislations? Can we make them somewhat better? I don't know, we have to truly resist them and, put, and push for the, um, uh, for, for, the, for the repeal of these oppressive legislations. That's the first thing. And secondly, we have to defend our right to protest. The states conveniently used COVID to push through legislation that clamps down on our right to free expression and assembly at a time they knew many of us wouldn't feel comfortable taking to the streets. These moments of crisis that the state so conveniently used as cover should also be seen as, as an opportunity for us as organizers because it shows that the state is weak or it would not resort to such cowardly tactics of pushing through these repressive legislations at a time when they know resistance to it would not be so visible out on the streets. And this is one way that we can think about this. We can change our, uh, our way of viewing these things from, from challenges to really opportunities to take the fight to the government on these issues. Um, and I think, I don't want to ramble on too much, but I think I'll leave my contribution then, perhaps in the uh, question and answer, we can come back to um, any points that people want me to expand upon.